Hi, everybody. Welcome to Community Conversations. My name is Courtney Shaw, and I'm the facilitator of our lecture series. Uh, we are back in HSB 101 for the rest of the quarter, as far as I know, unless something weird happens. We will be here 1130 on Thursdays for the rest of the quarter. Our full schedule is up on our website at lowercolumbia.edu slash conversations. And today I want to welcome a repeat customer to our community conversation series. And I always love having him come and talk because he always gives me lots of books to add to my summer reading list. So it's also great to do in the springtime because that's when I'm building my summer reading list. So Dr. Adam Wolfer is in his 22nd year as a chemistry instructor at LCC. He received his doctorate in science education, master's in chemistry and bachelor's in science education from Oregon State University, go Beavers which demonstrates his lack of imagination. <laughs> he is active in local theater and reads way too much. There is no such thing. He spent his early life in Montana and according to his wife is related to half of the residents of Montana. He apologizes in advance to his former English and writing teachers and to those that don't have ties to Montana. Oregon, Washington are fine states too. Thank you. This presentation is dedicated to his Montana family and friends. Please welcome Adam Wolfer. Thanks, and I have a favor to ask Courtney really quick. Yes. My aunt and uncle are trying oh, to get yeah. on if you can. Um, so I have lots of relatives in Montana and aunt and uncle who kind of played a part in this presentation trying to get on Zoom. And so they texted me minutes ago <laughs> saying there was a problem. So um, let me start. Yes, I've, I've taught here for 22 years. This is actually the room I normally teach in. Normally I have more students than this, but in the last two years, I haven't had any students in here. I, I haven't taught live for more than 15 minutes doing a lab prep type for many years. So we'll see how it goes. So a little bit about me. Um, this is a joke for those who have actually read a river runs through it, but I was born at the junction of great trout rivers in Western Montana, which is Missoula, Montana. Um, actually, at one point, there were four faculty members teaching here, all who were born in the same hospital in Missoula, Montana, which is the only hospital at the time. Um, I'm not sure how that happened. Two of us are still teaching here. One is now my supervisor, my dean, and one thought that getting married and having kids was more important than commuting from Olympia. So she's now teaching in Olympia. Um, I'm a second generation Montanan. My grandparents, Adam Gottfried and Elizabeth Olga Valansky, um, they immigrated to North America separately as children from the same village in what was then Austria-Hungary. Um, my grandmother was born in, in 1899. So she was um, many, many years ago, but they both ended up in the same town in North Dakota, got married, started having children, and then um, moved to Sweetgrass, Montana, and started a farm there, which um, the farm is still there, so, and my cousin lives in the next farm over. And if you cross the Canadian border in Sweetgrass, you may meet another one of my cousins. Um, but talk about that later. So my mom was the was the tenth of eleven children, which is why my wife thinks I'm related to half of the state of Montana. Um, and also because I can't go to Montana without running into someone who's a relative. Um, I have 55 first cousins um, and my mom still, she just, she turned 80 a year ago, still knows all of their birthdays and gets mad at herself when it just, oh shoot, it's Ryle's birthday. I forgot to send him a card. Um, I can barely remember the birthdays of my three siblings. So I don't understand it, but I love her dearly. I have to say that she may be watching. Um, my dad was the first of six children, 
He was born and raised in Missouri. Um, in his early 20s, he, his twin brother and two of his cousins decided they were done with Missouri summers. They went to Montana to work as farmhands. They had connections there. Um, and three of the four of them ended up marrying Montana girls. My godparents, John and Arlene Lager. John was my dad's cousin. And then Vink, who's the last time I've forgotten. Another one of my dad's cousins, he married a Montana girl. So fell in love with my mom. He went into the army for three years. When he came out, they got married and moved to Missoula. And then they started having children. And their favorite, of course, was me. My three siblings don't know I'm doing this presentation, so I'm, that won't get me in trouble. But I do need to point out in this picture, that's my sister, Cindy. That's me. I asked my mom to send me pictures of us as children in Montana. Every one of the pictures has my face blurred or obscured by something else. Um, I'm not sure if I should take that personally or not. That's my other brother, Ed, who is a year and a half younger than me, but we were raised like twins because we were, people thought we were. And my brother, Steve, for those of you who can count, that fifth person is my cousin, Dan. This is actually at the, the river that runs by my family cabin in just across from Glacier Park. In fact, some of those hills are in Glacier Park. Some of them aren't. Depends on which side of the river they're on. So, like I said, I'm from Missoula, just to give you some geography in there. And my grandfather's farm was in Sweetgrass, which is right on the Canadian border. In fact, growing up, my mom would go out to the fence and wave to Canada every morning. At least that's her story. And it's probably true. She remembers a lot. Can't get away with anything with my mother. She always remembers. So <clears throat> the name Big Sky Country, it's amazing what you find out if you start looking. I never knew what I thought had been called Big Sky Country forever. Actually, the name Big Sky Country for Montana is only as old as I am, which is 29. So it originated because of the book, The Big Sky Country by a Montana novelist named A.B. Guthrie Jr. And I also found out that there, this is the first in a series of six books about the West. I do have a copy of The Big Sky, which unfortunately, every time I've started to read it, something else Work-related has come up, but I have never finished it. So I guess I need to do that. That's on my summer reading list now. So what Big Sky Country means is it's reference to the unobstructed skyline in the state that seems to overwhelm the landscape at times, which is a pretty good description. Because if you've been to Montana, you look and it's like, wow. Because there's just, there's not some of the, Think the clouds, the smog, the haze that you find in other states, um, <clears throat> even though Montana is basically an agricultural state. So in 1962, the, the Montana State Highway Department decided to start calling it the Big Sky, um, called Big Sky Country. And someone, because someone had read this book and remembered and said, hey, what, why don't we call it Big Sky? Big Sky Country. So they did. And then for many years, it was on the um, license plates. And those of you who can do math, when I said that's only been around as long as I have, uh, I may have done the math wrong. Um, I also wanted to point out how Montanans and ex Montanans like myself feel about the state. This was a Facebook meme that was sent to me like a week ago by one of my cousins. And my mother has always referred to Montana as God's country. <clears throat> so 
And I love it. It fits basically with what a lot of my cousins will say. You know, I love the, especially during the pandemic that God replied, working from home. Okay, so let's get on to what brought you here. And I should keep track of what I'm doing. <clears throat> so Ivan Doig was a Montana writer. Um, he actually, I've met him twice. He came to Oregon State when I was in graduate school there. He was touring with, um, <clears throat> now where's the book? There's, he just finished, published his book, Bucking the Sun, about the, um, about people that did the Fort Peck Dam, which was at the time and maybe still is the largest earthen dam in the world. Um, David, this is where you're, correct me if I'm wrong. David, what's that? Okay. <clears throat> but so he, he came and I, it was just before Mother's Day. And I thought, what a great Mother's Day present. So I went to the presentation, bought a copy of Bucking the Sun, had him sign it, dedicate it to my mother, and then found out, so at that point I didn't know, that he went to Valier High School which is in the same competitive district as Sunburst High School where my mother went and they actually played each other in football. <laughs> so he was born in White Sulphur Springs, Montana, which is in the center of the state. And then just before high school, he, his dad and his grandmother moved to Dupuy or Montana, which until <clears throat> I started reading his books, I had no idea that that town even existed but he went to Valier High School like I said so at the beginning of April my brother and I drove to Montana for my aunt's 90th birthday she lives in Conrad town near Valier and the ha house we were staying in for that weekend was just down the street from Valier High School so I said I need to get a picture so I got a picture and my brother said I have a feeling he didn't go to that actual building which I'm pretty sure since he graduated in 1957, I have a feeling that's not the school he was in. But he received a scholarship to Northwestern. And so went to Northwestern, majored in journalism, got his BS and MS, started working as a journalist. <clears throat> then, in then he ended up at working in Seattle and then started going to school at the University of Washington, to get his PhD in history. And so he, um, there it is. Well, uh, and they quoted him in the um, article in Montana paper when he passed away, said, what graduate school taught me though, was that I wanted to write more than I wanted to teach. So he um, then went on to become a writer. And I'm, Thankfully, he did. I mean, if you read any of his books, you understand that he is a historian, because even the fiction has a strong basis in history. So, White Sulphur Springs, they're in the center of Montana. I've been through there at least once that I can remember. And actually, a couple of years ago, my wife and daughter ended up staying overnight in a hotel there and went to one of the bars there. Uh, and one of his books, he describes the, at that time, the six bars that were there. She said that there's now only one. It's a small town. It's happened a lot in Montana. Towns that were centers of agriculture have shrunk quite a bit. White Sulphur Springs was um, where the, the railroad started or it has a railroad place where basically all the farmers would bring their their crops their animals to sell and get them on the train so then Dupuyer Valier excuse me and I was also surprised when I found out he was from Valier because 
I have two uncles who farmed in Valier. One of them I spent a lot of time with because um, my uncle Wally and Aunt Catherine had um, five children, three of whom are about the same age as I am. So we spent a lot of time together summers, spent a lot of time on Uncle Wally's farm. So his first book was This House of Sky, Landscapes of Western Mind. It's a memoir of basically his life growing up with his father, Charlie Doig, and his grandmother, Bessie Ringer. Um, it starts about the time his mother passed away. His mother passed away from asthma on his sixth birthday. So he, um, he writes about what it was like growing up as basically a farm kid. His father was um, a foreman, sheepman, um, hayman, basically whatever he could do in that area of White Sulphur Springs. So <clears throat> this is how he described, oh, I need to go back one because um, Courtney will appreciate this. Ivan Doig went and interviewed as many people as he could find that knew his grandmother and his father. And that became part of the book. So there are quotes from people about his grandmother and father interspersed throughout the book in their own words, which having been, uh, being a Montana kid was kind of cool to hear what was definitely Montana words. So, so um, when he was about nine or 10, his father was diagnosed with some serious illness that might have taken his life. So, so for the first time, mortality was crowding Charlie Doig slowly enough that he could think it through and the and across that charring summer, it brought him to the greatest change of mind he could make. He needed someone in readiness to step into his place in my life. The readiest person on the face of the planet was the one who had loomed in his dark musings all this while. My father had everything to gulp back then and when he set out to make truce with his phantom grandmother of mine. I can hear as if in a single clear echo, the pivoting of her lice right there. Dad beginning his def desperate phone call in the lobby of the Sherman Hotel, spelling out her name in an embarrassed half shout to the operator, staring miserably at the cars nosing off around the prow of the hotel as the long distance line hummed and howled in his ear. Then, uh, hello, Bessie, this is Charlie. Charlie, Charlie Doig. No, Ivan's fine, fine, he's right here. Uh, say, would you, would you gonna be home on Sunday? We could uh, come over maybe and see you. All right, all right then, goodbye. So the rest of the book is about his life with his father, Charlie, and his grandmother, Bessie, who don't like each other very well. Actually, Bessie tried to get in the way of his um, dad and mom marrying and and then when his mom passed away, I think she blamed his dad for part of that, which really wasn't um, his fault. But so if you're a writer, the reception was, must have blown his mind. He was a finalist for the National Book Award for his first book, which the writers who made their living their entire life and never were a finalist for that prestigious award. It's also um, the San Francisco Chronicle in 1999 published a list of the top Western nonfiction books and the top Western fiction books. This was number four on that list. And just to show that I was never a farm kid, but I got to pretend to be a farm kid. That's my sister and I swimming in the grain at one of my uncle's farms or my grandfather's farm. My mom didn't really tell me which one it is, but based on our ages, I think it's my uncle Joe's farm, which had been my grandfather's farm. So then he started writing fiction. 
1984, he came out with the book English Creek. And it is part of a trilogy. Well, actually, he also um, received awards for this. He won the Western Heritage Award for the best Western novel. And this one is number 12 on the list of Western fiction books. So he's one of three or four authors I could find that have a book both in fiction and nonfiction on that list. Um, then the sequel to that was Dancing at the Rascal Fair, which is not really a sequel, it's a prequel because English Creek is about Jick McCaskill, who is 10 or 11 year old boy growing up in the town called, he named Gross Venture, Montana, which is based on Dupuyer, Montana. And then Dancing with the Rascal Fair is about Jick's grandparents who immigrated from Scotland. Um, his grandfather and great uncle came to Montana and started farming there. And also because it wasn't, um, wasn't a way to get rich. They have other side jobs, which make the book really interesting and Dance at the Rascal Fair. And then the sequel to those is Jick as an older man in 1989, the celebrating the Montana centennial. He drives his daughter Mariah around Montana. She's a photographer and her ex-husband who is with them is a journalist and they're going around Montana celebrating the, the centennial of Montana. So this is called the McCaskill Trilogy or the Two Medicine Trilogy because it's based on the Two Medicine um, area, which is just uh, southeast of Glacier Park. And So I'll, just to make sure, um, so in, in this, Jick's father is a um, forest ranger. So he's with his dad going up and checking on the shepherds who have paid for, to use some of the um, forest land to um, feed their sheep in the summer. And as they're doing that, their dog alerts to something and they notice a rider coming up. And so I love the description of the writer. The writer sat in his saddle that permanent way a lot of those old timers did, as if he lived up there and couldn't imagine sufficient reason to venture down off the back of a horse. Not much of his face showed between the buttoned up slicker and the pulled down brown Stetson. But thinking back on it now, I'm fairly sure that my father at once recognized both the horseman and the situation. So the man was um, another character from uh, Stanley Meixel, who ends up being an important character in the book. And just to make sure I end up having enough time, I'm gonna move on. So I also wanted to find out two medicine. I know there's, there is a two medicine, so I looked for two medicine Montana. This is the first thing that came up, two medicine lake. And that area that it, the river drains into, it's called the two medicine area. And I just like, yeah, that's Glacier Park. And that's the beautiful area of the state I have spent much time in. Never been to Two Medicine Lake, but been to others. And then I finally got to read an, um, another book of his called Heart Earth. Heart Earth is based on, is, he doesn't really talk about his mom much in this land of sky, but he does talk about her a lot in Heart Earth because, well, she died when he was six. He didn't have a lot of memories of her. Um, the book came about because his uncle Wally passed away and willed him the letters that his mother had written to him during World War II when Wally was in the Navy. So he got to read his mother's own words about what was happening in their life. And so he wrote this book based on it. 
that's what historians do, right? <laughs> See, I know something. I always have to try and impress Courtney because she's like one of the smartest people I know. Um, so this is basically a prequel to this house of sky. And it's great to learn about that, um, the life that he led up until the death of his mother. So he's written 16 books, most of them fiction. So I found a list of them, thought I'd point that out. A bunch of them are based on the town of Gross Venture, based on, which is really um, Dupuyer, but he, um, or Dupuyer, I need to ask someone who's from there exactly how they pronounce it. Um, because like I said, I'd never heard of it until I started reading his books, but all these books are ones that take part in gross venture or are part of the McCaskill family. So he started taking members of the McCaskill family and putting them in different situations and writing about that. And then um, these three are make up what's called the Butte Trilogy. So if you ever want to know more about Montana history, all of these except for the Sea Runners take place in Montana and he really knew his history. He spent time doing that. And I also found this in one books. I kind of knew I had it. He came here in 2013 as a fundraiser for the, um, the Longview Public Library. And he spoke here on campus and I went and I, that's the second time I met him. I got a, one of his books signed and also spoke to him a little bit and told him I, my mom was from that area. And he goes, oh, Sunburst. Yeah, we used to play them in football. Turns out that he played against at least two of my uncles um, when he was in high school based on his age. My uncle Fritz, who um, said that he Uncle Fritz would have been a senior when Ivan was a freshman, so doubt they played, but then my Uncle Ralph probably did. Um, and then he's written some nonfiction books, which I've talked, we've talked about mostly already. Um, and again, the um, except for news or consumers guide, he wrote that with his wife. I know nothing about it except for that. It's on the list. Um, Winter Brothers, he is actually about the Puget Sound area. He studied the diaries of James Gilchrist Swan, who was one of the first settlers in the Puget Sound area. And then he spent time kind of visiting the places that um, Swan had lived and he kept his own diary. And so the the book is basically a dialogue between the two of them, even though Swan had passed away many, many years before, but juxtaposing their, their um, experiences. So Norman McLean is probably one of my favorite authors. Courtney asked about earlier what's on my bookshelves. There's a huge amount of Stephen King because we, my wife and I own every Stephen King book. Um, and I have read all of them as well. Um, but also then I have a huge section of Montana books. But Norm McLean kind of started that for me. Norm McLean was born in Iowa. Then his father was a Presbyterian minister who became minister at church in Missoula. And so that's where he was raised. During the summers, um, after he was like 15 or 16, because that was during World War I, there weren't a lot of men available to work in the f for logging or forest service. So he spent his teenage years spending the summers working as a logger and working for the forest service. Even while he was going to school, are going to college, he'd come home and work for them. So graduated Missoula County High School, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, but then he went to Dartmouth College. We got a BS and MS in English. 
And then he taught at Dartmouth for a while and then decided to um, get a PhD. So he went to the University of Chicago, worked on his PhD there as well as taught English. And that's where um, he ended up marrying his wife who was from Montana as well. She came out uh, with him and they got married. Um, but his father had built a cabin on Sealy Lake, which is not far from Missoula. And so he always went there, spent the summer fishing and enjoying the summer. And once he retired, that's where he spent his time. So again, Missoula is here. Sealy Lake is this wide spot in the river here as best I can tell. Um, and it's in his writing, he talks about the summer people who summer in Sealy Lake and they're mostly rich people from other states who have bought up property there and built really nice cabins that aren't really cabins. You know, they are houses on the lake. Um, that's where I, my family's cabin in Montana, I tell people, hey, we could go there and visit. And I have to then explain to them what a real cabin is. There is no running water. So the facilities are out the back and down a little path. Um, there's no heat. There's no insulation. Um, some of them instantly say, no, no, thanks. Um, I got my wife to go there with me probably why we're married because she's the first woman I dated who actually seemed interested in going there. Um, okay, so once he retired from the University of Chicago, he started writing. And so he wrote, A River Runs Through It and Other Stories. The book has a kind of interesting history because he was writing it and all the time he was talking to his adult children, telling them he's writing it. But once he started to find someone to publish it, no one would publish it. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit later, but it contains three works. A River Runs Through It, which usually is categorized as a novella, which I've learned from my Stephen King is basically just a short novel. Um, then Logging and Pimping and Your Pal Jim, just a short story about him working in the, um, as a logger. And then USFS 1919, The Ranger of the Cook and A Hole in the Sky, about him working in, uh, with the Forest Service. And they're kind of in reverse chronicle, chronological order in the book. Um, and he wrote them in chronological order. He wrote the USFS 1919 first and then logging and pimping your pal Jill and then a Jim and then a river runs through it. Um, but a river runs through it. I love his prose poetry way of writing and I'll try to do it justice by reading it. Um, in our family, there's no clear line between religion and fly fishing. Wonderful first sentence for a book. We lived at the junction of great trout rivers in Western Montana, and our father was a Presbyterian minister and a fly fisherman who tied his own flies and taught others. He told us about Christ's disciples being fishermen, and we were left to assume, as my brother and I did, that all first-class fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, Galilee were fly fishermen, and that John, the favorite was a dry fly fisherman. It is true that one day a week was given over wholly to religion. On Sunday mornings, my brother Paul and I went to Sunday school and then to morning services to hear our father preach, and in the evenings to Christian endeavor and afterwards to evening services to hear our father preach again. In between on Sunday afternoons, we had to study the Westminster Shorter Catechism for an hour and then recite before we could walk the hills with him while he unwound between services. But he never asked us more than the first question in the catechism. What is the chief end of man? And we answered together so one of us could carry on if the other forgot. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This always seemed to satisfy him as indeed such a beautiful answer should have. 
Besides, he was anxious to be on the hills where he could restore his soul and be filled again to overflowing for the evening sermon. So I learned about A River Runs Through It because the movie came out in 1992. I was living in upstate New York and every weekend I would, I was running a residence hall. So basically I lived with the students that I was supervising. So every weekend I would take off and go somewhere to get away from the rotten little brats. Uh, no, I loved my students, but um, so I would go to a, a mall that existed back then and I would um, find a movie to watch. And so I saw that A River Runs Through It was coming and I was like, well, that might be okay. I had heard that Robert Redford had directed it. And so I went into, I had like a couple hours before it would start. So I went into a bookstore and I saw the book, picked it up and said, talks about the story of two young men growing up in Montana. I went, okay, I'm sold. So I went and saw the movie, went back to campus that um, next week, and ran into a friend of mine who taught English. And she said, oh, I have the book. You have to read it, especially since you're from Missoula. And so I read the book and have read it many times since. But um, so, like I said, the book couldn't find a publisher. And the joke was that, that no one wanted to publish it because there are too many trees in the book. So he had friends in, since he was a professor of English, uh, or at that point he's retired, but had been professor of English for a long time. The University of Chicago Press said they would publish it. And they're probably pretty glad they did because they went through many, many printings of the book. It's become very popular. And it was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize in Letters in 1977. Unfortunately, it didn't win. Um, the story is that the fiction committee that made the recommendation to the overall committee recommended the, that this book win the Pulitzer Prize in fiction for that year. But the overall committee said, well, there's not enough fiction worthy of a Pulitzer Prize, and we're not gonna uh, give the award to anybody. Um, several people said, oh, they didn't wanna give it because there's too many trees. So, I, and I'm not sure, there could be some of that in reason he didn't get it. And so this is number 20 on the list of top Western fiction books. And then they did make a movie of a river runs through it in 1992. Robert Redford had to meet with Norman McLean several times to convince him that he would treat it with respect he want, uh, that Norman wanted. Because even though it's fiction, it's the story of his family, story of his brother Paul and his brother Paul's death. Brother Paul was beaten to death. Um, when is still a fairly young man. Um, it is fiction because in the book, in the movie, it happens in Montana and there's implications. It's the gamblers in Montana that did it. He actually was living in Chicago at, as well. Norman was living in Chicago too. So his brother, Paul was also living in Chicago and not sure what happened. Um, still an unsolved mystery. Norman was convinced that his brother had gotten in trouble with um, the gamblers in Montana, and that's what caused that. But directed by Robert Redford, starred Craig Schaefer, Brad Pitt, who was still fairly new to the movie game at that point, um, Tom Skerritt, who's one of my favorite actors, and Brenda Blethyn. They also made a movie of The Ranger, the Cook, and A Hole in the Sky a few years later, it was a made for TV movie and it's pretty good, faithful adaptation um, starring Sam Elliott and Jerry O'Connell. Ricky Jay plays the cook. Ricky Jay is a, is a magician who also moonlights as an actor. So if you know the story, you understand why they would cast a magician in that. Um, so, 
I thought, you know, I have a lot of friends who are English professors. I should do the right thing and read criticism of these authors and their work. That didn't last very long because the first one I picked up was uh, called Haunted by Waters, Narrative Recollection in Norman McLean's The River Runs Through It. And so I read the sentence, in an age when some literary theorists, because of their allegiances to post-structuralist philosophies concerning the nature of language, have called into question the ability of story to communicate truth. McLean, a neo-Aristotelian, refuses to accept the claims of deconstruction and asserts his faith in art's ability to imitate life, contending that certain events in life hold more poetic force or power than others. So as soon as they started throwing out deconstruction and neo-Aristotelian, I was out. Um, but I did find a wonderful essay by Wallace Stegner, who is an, another Montana writer. And he wrote, said, I speak as if the stories, um, as if the stories were about real people. I think they are. McLean gives us no reason to make a distinction between real and fictional people. The stories are so frankly autobiographical that one suspects he hasn't even bothered to alter names. The only thing that has happened to young McLean's experience is that it has been recollected in tranquility, seen in perspective, understood, and fully felt. The stories are distillation, almost an exorcism. And actually, if you read much about it, and actually there's, there is a quote in the book about why he wrote it. It was therapy for him, dealing with his brother's death, because he, the whole story of A River Runs Through It is about Norman trying to help his brother who keeps getting himself in trouble with drinking and fighting and gambling. So it says, once for instance, my father asked me a series of questions that suddenly made me wonder whether I understood even my father I felt closer to than any man I've ever known. You like to tell true stories, don't you? He asked, and I answered, yes, I like to tell stories that are true. Then he asked, after you've finished your true story sometime, why don't you make up a story and the people to go with it? Only then will you understand what happened and why. It is those we live with and love and should know who elude us. It's near the end of that story, beautiful thought and I get a little verklempt when I read it because I love my father greatly. He loved me. We we're very different people. Um, and so there are a lot of times we didn't understand each other very well. Okay, this book kind of brought us together and I'm running out of time. Um, in that <clears throat> Man Gulch fire was the largest tragedy in the Forest Service and was for many, many years. Um, 15 fire smoke jumpers jumped into a fire in the Man Gulch area of Montana. 12 of them died. And Norm McLean was fascinated with it from his time working as a, um, in the Forest Service. And so he wrote about it. Unfortunately, he didn't live to see this book in print. He died in 1990. This is number 19 on the list of top Western nonfiction books. And um, there was a lot of discussion at the time of the Man Gulch fire. And it was in the late forties. Um, and I didn't write down what year. I should have done that. But about why the 12 of them died. And so he, coming from 40, almost 50 years later, examined the fire and what the fire, uh, what the Forest Service learned, what the smoke jumpers learned based on it. But if you notice the, um, the tail number on this plane, that plane was owned and operated by Johnson Flying Service, which is, my dad's employer. He worked for the Johnson's Flying Service from the time he got out of the army until they were bought out by another company called Evergreen Airlines, which you may have heard of based in McMinnville. Um, so 
This is the restoration of that plane, now dubbed the Miss Montana. It's a Douglas C-47, or it was built as a C-47. The C-47 and the DC-3 are the same plane, just depends if it was built for the military or if it's built for civilian use. So my father worked on this plane for many years, and it's quite possible I flew in this plane. This is 1965, and that is the plane that my mom, my sister, my, bro my brother, myself, my dad flew in from McCall, Idaho to Missoula, Montana. I'm, my mom is very upset because you cannot see the call numbers on it. So she can't prove that's the Miss Montana, but in her mind it is, because they also had a couple of other DC-3s. Um, and I sort of remember this trip. I remember my dad falling through the floor of the cabin they gave us to live in. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if it is or not. And they restored the Miss Montana and it flew in the D-Day celebration several years ago. And this is the book about that called Every Reason to Fail. That's me sitting in the cockpit of the Miss Montana in the Museum of Mountain Flying. Uh, the Museum of Mountain Flying is in Missoula, Montana, basically just a few hundred feet from where my dad used to work. And with lots of pictures of people my dad used to work with and stuff. Um, so Norm McLean's son, John McLean, just published this in 2021. It's essays about growing up in Montana, about a river runs through it, about um, a lot of things. He also went on a trip following the Lewis and Clark expedition through parts of Montana that I'm familiar with. Um, I need to finish up. So I really wanted to bring better actor than myself to read the final words of a river runs through it unfortunately um he never returned my phone calls or emails or texts so i'm going to cheat and show the last minutes of the movie read by a better actor than me much better actor now nearly all those i loved and did not understand in my youth are dead even jesse but I still reach out to them. Of course, now I'm too old to be much of a fisherman. And now I usually fish the big waters alone, although some friends think I shouldn't. But when I'm alone in the half light of the canyon, all existence seems to fade to a being with my soul and memories. And the sounds of the big Blackfoot River and a four count rhythm, and the hope that a fish will rise. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words and some of the words are theirs. I am haunted by waters. You can probably see why it won an, um, an Oscar for cinematography. Um, 
they did a great job of showing the Montana, especially since Montana has changed in the many years, well, from the 1920s to the 19, until 1992. Um, just so I don't get in trouble with my Aunt Leanne, because when I told her I was doing this, she goes, what about Wallace Stegner? So for those who, who know Montana writing, he is probably the, the lead of Montana writers. Um, his book, Angle of Repose, which my aunt introduced me to, she, um, it was in the shelves of her house. I love visiting her because she's got shelves and shelves of books. Um, that was the number one on that list I've mentioned before. And then on the fiction or nonfiction one, he has number two beyond the hundredth meridian. So I want to thank my mom, Evelyn Gottfried Wolfer, my aunt Leanne Gottfried, who has turned me on to many books over the, my life, um, especially since I started when I was a teenager. Um, and Marm Bowman, who was my high school English teacher, who when I graduated from OSU and then went back as a substitute teacher in McMinnville High School, she saw me and goes, oh, great, are you an English teacher? And I'm hoping I didn't laugh at her because I love English, I love reading, um, but I can never be an English teacher. Um, science is my first love. She probably knew that. And then Linda Greenewald, who introduced me to A River Runs Through It, loaned me her book for the summer. I eventually bought a copy myself. Um, and uh, so then some other references, but I think we have a little bit of time for questions, I hope. Uh, yes, and actually I have a question starting up. So you started talking about Young Man and Fire and I was thinking this has to be the basis of the song Cold Missouri Water, right? Somewhat. Cold Missouri Water, the folk song. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of that. Song. Okay, well then I have research I've got to do. Okay, because I was okay. like, that has got to be the story of this. So yeah, um, this was very evocative and lovely to 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 get a sense of and made me really know that I finally need to read A River Runs Through It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, there was a movie based on the Man Gulch Fire they played fast and loose with a lot of the facts. It's called Red Skies Over Montana. I've seen it. It doesn't really, want, but it, it took, takes the tragedy and then put, adds in a love story, you know, that from the 1950s movie. Okay, let's get some questions. Hi, very interesting. My name is uh, Neil. Um, am I getting this straight? Did both men retired, then they became published authors? Um, actually, Ivan Doig was working as an English professor at University of Washington when he started writing and realized that's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to be a professor, didn't want to teach, didn't do, want to do that prof professorial stuff that um, those of us who love it, if I can see at least four LCC faculty members here hmm. um, that, he didn't want to, so he wrote. But was, he loved the history. He did the research. Yeah. I was lucky enough to take a, a road trip a few years back when gas was cheaper. Anyway, uh, Montana, oh, it's a beautiful state, but I tell you what, it's a large state. I did not believe it at the time. I had to look it up. It's the fourth largest state. Mm -hmm. I thought I would never get through it. <laughs> I mean, the roads were great, but there's nobody on the roads. And uh, <laughs> I could see why they say big sky. It was, a, it was really a, a wonderful place to visit. Yeah. It's the fourth largest state by, by um, acreage or square miles. It's the 41st state by population. Mm -hmm. So the density is pretty spread out, especially Eastern Montana, which is like parts of Eastern Washington is just flat and not a lot. Okay, so I will ask another question. Uh, so if you are building a summer reading list, just hypothetically, what would be the one book from each author that you would recommend? Um, maybe because they bring back memories of my childhood, but A River Runs Through It, you have to read it. it especially if you have a sibling who maybe is different than you, 
in um, beautiful story. And then the, the other two stories are great. They're little, they're very different, but um, as Norm McLean told his son, he put off writing the story about his brother, Paul for years because he felt like he needed to write it, but he didn't know if he could do it justice. And he did. Um, and then, um, now where'd I play? This House of Sky. If you're interested in that type of life, it's, it's a life that mo a lot of my aunts and uncles lived. I never did. My father hated farming in Missouri and left farming. He said he'd never, that's why he went into the military. He said, I'm going in the military, to learn a trade so I don't have to be a farmer. Um, but that's a beautiful book. Also, um, his last book is was published just after his death, this Ivan Doig, um, Last Bus to Wisdom. It's a fun book because the main character is a young boy. For some reason I like the books about childhood stuff. And he goes to Wisconsin to live with his grandmother's aunt for the summer. And um, Ivan Doig said it's one of his most autobiographical books because he did that, did that trip. And while he's there, he and his um, great aunt's husband decide they can't put up with her anymore and they run away. And they go back through many adventures, including Yellowstone Park, and they end up in Big Hole, Montana, which is an area in Montana where the town of Wisdom is. So the last bus to Wisdom is kind of a pun, and, a, and that's the end of the book is them going to Wisdom to work as farmhands. But Okay. Well, thank you so much to Adam for sharing all of this great stuff with us today. Thank you to our audience, uh, both here in person and on Zoom. And I invite you to come back next week for Allison McCready's presentation, In Search of a Safe Place, Refugees, Asylum Seekers, and Internally Displaced Persons. So please join us again next week.